by uh, Dr. Hesby. Uh, we've had Hexadata guys uh, showing us how to implement GBMs fast. Uh, and I thought a good way of rounding this would be showing how it looks like for the end user. Uh, so in my particular case, uh, I work in marketing algorithms and analytics. And that's part of the uh, algorithm and analytics horizontal within Netflix. Uh, we touch pretty much all the aspects of Netflix, from finance to the product, going through algorithm uh, design. Uh, and because I work in marketing, and we also be talking about marketing algorithm and analytics, uh, we basically work with the marketing team, and that covers both the social, the online displays, so all the ads that you would see anywhere in the internet uh, telling you to join Netflix, uh, as well as the paid search. And also we work with the finance team in forecasting and predictive analytics. Uh, this is basically uh, working in three different areas. So I'll be talking a bit about uh, two of those uh, in which we actually use DBMs uh, to model uh, user behavior. So the first one is customer journey analysis. And I'll explain you what exactly the customer journey is. It's actually the non-customer journey. It's somebody that still didn't join Netflix. Uh, and in there, we use DBMs with logistic regression to do what, what's called attribution, so trying to figure out which channels are actually effectively bringing users into the, into the service, uh, and also ad optimization. Uh, it's more and more uh, common to just decide on the fly which users get to see an ad, and we want to be very good at picking those that are actually likely to join. Uh, and then in the behavior analysis, we are also interested in uh, predicting who is likely to cancel, who is likely to turn and leave the service, and understand why that's happening. So we use both GBM uh, with uh, cost proportional hazards and accelerated, accelerated failure times, uh, as well as some in-house uh, kind of model. And finally, we do forecasting, which is basically time series analysis uh, that Right now we are not using GBM, we could be using it in an auto-regressive framework, but we are. So what do you uh, use for forecasting? Uh, we basically use just the ARIMA part of it, right? Um, so we do GBMs lately, we are very excited about hex data, bringing this to light speed. Uh, and we've been very data testers from, I, I don't know if from the beginning, but for a while. So some of the features that you were seeing, uh, namely, uh, hex data running smoothly in EC2 and the grid search, which is, at least for us, something very important, uh, were born out of this collaboration. So please do ask these guys to implement more features because they do it. Um, yeah. So <laughs> I'm going to cover uh, just two really fast. So I talk about this uh, customer journey analysis. So what, what is the problem that we are trying to solve here with logistic regression and GBM? Uh, so if we see somebody that actually joined, uh, that would be the end of the arrow. So somebody, we have a user, a happy user that now is using Netflix. We go back for, a, for an amount of time, say 28 days prior to joining, and try to see what it is that this user saw that made him join Netflix. So in this particular case, this, uh, this happy, woman, uh, first of all, she received an email because she used to be a member and she wasn't anymore. So we sent an email telling her, check us out. We are even more awesome than we were before. We want you back. Uh, but that didn't uh, have the effect intended. And, but at some point, she remembered this email and then does a search and she sees a paid search ad that she clicks. But is still not ready to join. Uh, then she's browsing, she sees another ad somewhere else that she doesn't really do anything about, that would be the display. And then she sees another ad that she clicks, that she still doesn't join. And then some days after, she finally comes by her own will to the page and joins. Now the question is, who brought the customer to the website? Because each one of these efforts cost money, right? Uh, so the answer to that, we can get it by analyzing all the different users that came to the website 
and at some point join or not join or didn't join our service. Uh, the problem here, and that's where the hexa data uh, comes into place, is that any given day we get millions of visits, and when we go on those visits and try to reconstruct these journeys, we are looking at billions of events that we have to kind of go through every day. Um, so this is a logistic regression because basically we have a set of touch points for each one of the users that did or did not result into, into an actual conversion. And what we want is a model that assigns some probability of conversion to each one of the visits. Uh, the way we build the model is always the same. Try to not complicate things when we don't have to complicate them. Right? So we build models with not that many features, and we keep adding features. We don't get to the several thousands of genetics, but we can get to the hundreds. Uh, we do explore the kind of parameters that uh, Dr. Hastie talked about, such as the number of interactions, and also uh, how much do we want to complicate the model. In this particular case, the question was the temporal part uh, to encode that when you have several, uh, several days and several types of variables and so on, uh, gets really increases by a lot the number of variables playing in the model by sevenfold. So does it matter and do we have to do this, right? Uh, with time, we identify different things that are important, such as at what time did you actually land in the web page because people usually don't join Netflix while they are working. Uh, did you actually saw any email campaign uh, and so on? Um, but the basic model is very is is at heart just a gradient boosted uh, model uh, that we like for the very reasons that were explained before. Uh, gradient boosted decision trees handle nicely missing values and also uh, they because they are trees they are really incorporate these nonlinear effects that are always in marketing problems because you are usually less receptive the more ads you get. So when you plot the effect of the ad versus the number of times that you're exposed, it's almost never a linear function. Uh, in the training part, uh, that's why we want these grid sets to happen in hexa data, because we usually do a parameter sweep on the different variables that we have to look at, such as interaction depth, uh, bag infraction, and, uh, and so on. And we do the threefold cross validation within the trend set, and then we have a whole set, whole set at some point where we actually evaluate performance. Even though training is very expensive, the evaluation is cheap, especially if somebody writes the Java code for you. Um, <laughs> and uh, in our case, we actually use P and Python, but we could be using Java. Uh, and then there's some other <coughs> magic into the model, which is very, namely, how do you turn something that is variable in time into a fixed width data set that you can use to train? And that's where the feature engineering uh, goes into place, and that's a little bit more creativity and basically domain knowledge. Uh, then we have this other details that we found important, uh, especially that when you have conversions which are very rare events, you are usually much better off by throwing away some of the negative examples because otherwise you're going to just uh, be spinning your wheels in, in no conversion. Uh, and after all that, we we train the model that predicts. So this is not an easy problem. We don't have that much data about you. We don't know when you arrived what was your intent. But still, just using marketing. Um, marketing touch points and some details about at what time was your visit, we get in our uh, target metric, which is uh, area under the curve, we get up to 80% with the, with the model training in all the temporal components. If we throw that away, we do drop up to 72, 73, and that's a very significant difference when you talk about AUC. Uh, so we keep the complex model. And something that was already mentioned, but is, is worth noting, is that indeed when we go from our training set to our test set, we don't see a significant drop in performance. Partly because when we compute our metric 
even in the trends that we use folder cross validation. Uh, but still, it's good to see that things don't drop after. Uh, and currently, we are using this model to both understand better the efficiency of our different marketing channels and to optimize the ads that we uh, put out there. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, we will bother people less and we will get more customers. And, um, and the second one is just uh, because we have only talked about uh, regression and classification, I thought I would add uh, something that we do quite a bit, which is lifetime analysis, and it's not the kind of the standard application, but at least that's what I get whenever I try to look for help on the internet. Um, <laughs> so, so in lifetime analysis, what we want to see is how long will the will a given user stay with us. We want to know if we are getting better at retaining people because they are happier, uh, if there's better markets and worse markets and so on. And uh, in this case, our data set is comprised of basically time until you cancel and whether you actually cancel at the end of our observation period because some people just don't cancel. Um, the interesting part of lifetime analysis is that it allows for this kind of censoring. So we don't have to, even though I'm studying the distribution of canceling times, even if you didn't cancel, I can count you into the study, which is a better representation of what's actually happening. Uh, in our particular case, we found out that breaking out the canceling in two very different reasons helps a lot in the modeling. So you can cancel because you don't like us, or you can cancel because you don't want to pay. And those two are very separate motives to cancel. And it turns out that if you do that and do model that way, you get better models. So I do use GBM and we use this Cox proportional hazards, which is a very nice model because it doesn't really impose a distribution on the on the hazard rate. Meaning, if you think about when it is that if we are interested in daily cancels, uh, if you if you see how uh, the cancel cycle occurs. They usually tend to occur every 30 days because that's when you have to part with money and that's the time that you reconsider. Uh, so we do want something that is non-parametric in uh, describing this daily uh, daily churn. And what it does, it really uh, models the actual effect of the regressors as some kind of multiplicative effect in the base hazard. So it just basically modifies the odds ratio, the conditional odds ratio every day of you cancel it tomorrow given that you were here today. Uh, so in this case, uh, something that is of note and I was already talking with the Hexa data guys is that not always your metric is deviance or the things that you usually train on. So for example, in this in this case, uh, we wanted something similar to AUC because it's kind of a classification problem. But in this case, it's not the same uh, to be able to uh, so, so in this case, we want to rank people, and we want to we want to see that the people that they stay longer will stay always at the top. What we use is this integrated AUC, which kind of breaks down the, the 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 performance of the model daily. So every day, on the people that actually stayed up to this day, I'm going to classify them in churning or not canceling or not this given day, and that will give me a daily AUC. And then I'm going to integrate that across the whole a uh, span of different days that we can that users stay and weight up my daily AUC uh, accordingly to how many people stay each one of those days. So I want just yes, I want just yes, one number that lets me compare models and that's the, the number that we actually end up computing. Uh, so when I do that, uh, this is these are results for my grid search. So in this case what I'm doing is I want to train models, so I'm going to train all the models doing my three-fold cross-validation within the train set, but I'm going to try to see what the effect is of different parameters. So you have number of trees, you have your interaction depth, and then you have also this value fraction. Uh, might or might not be important, but definitely we see the same patterns, although in my case my metric is good when it's higher, so these plots have exactly the opposite shape to the ones that Dr. Hastie was already showing, uh, but we see more or less the same effect. So when I use the string page, which actually is higher than the standard of EVM, the reason right now is that I'm actually limited in the number of trees because it takes a long time. So I 
in order for me to train, if I'm training in a thousand trees, even though in this particular case, so if you look at the at string cages that are uh, smaller, meaning we actually learn slower, we probably will end up generalizing better. But at the time that I reach my thousand trees, I'm still very, very early on the game. So it, it might be the case, and actually if you just squint a bit, you could maybe make the case that at 10,000 trees, I might be better off using the uh, small shrinkage. However, I need the model for next week. So maybe when, when we have the data data guys giving us 100,000 uh, trees models, we won't have this problem. Uh, and then we have the effect of interaction depth. So in line of what, uh, with what uh, was already said, so if you have an interaction depth of two, you only have interaction depth of two variables, and that doesn't do as well as three-way interactions, but then when you start going from three to four to five, you don't really see that much improvement. There is an improvement, but it's, it's very small. So this is kind of how you would actually figure out how to put this uh, limit on this. Um, I think I'm not going to steal more time from you. I hope you get a taste of what it is that we are doing. And if you like it, apply for a job. Uh, <laughs> How much experience is necessary? Huh? How much experience is necessary? How much experience is necessary? <laughs> give, you, uh, give an idea by giving the background of this co speaker, the speaker here. Antonio has done tremendous things before. Uh, thanks for a wonderful talk. Um, he's done neuroscience, he's done lots of different physics, biophysics, and, and now he's doing, uh, put his brain power behind Chris' team, um, and has been a great host for us um, in the last um, six to nine months of our interaction partnership with this team. We have learned a heck of a lot, and uh, all the minor, minute features he has asked of us have been really product success everywhere. Um, and um, every time, you, uh, I think there's enough people in the audience um, who are from Hex Data, whom I'll ask briefly for, to raise their hands, um, who have basically incurred the wrath of Antonio. Uh, <laughs> so, um, but, but in a good way, because that actually scaled the product. So uh, just to, to, to take a uh, raise of hands, um, startups are team sports, as you all know. Uh, these are not done by one person. Uh, the team consists of your customer, as well as your your architect on this side and the, and the overall team. So just a raise of hands from the Hex Data team. Uh, we've done every one of them. I think we were coding to the last minute before the demo today. Um, and Angie, uh, who's done the R work, Tom, and, um, and, and future Hex Data people as well. And um, so, but uh, definitely, this has been a, a wonderful journey for us. So thank you for hosting us. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I did steal the time from uh, here to take questions. So uh, feel free to ask questions to whoever you want. Yeah, how can you use the, uh, tr the boosting trees for inference on the um, uh, attribution problem? Because I imagine that like your display ad teams are also trying to optimize, and your email marketing teams are trying to optimize, so if you're, like, your display ad teams are optimizing and trying to serve to the people who are most likely to convert, and then you're using the boosting trees to do inference and end up saying, like, I mean, everything in an ideal world, everything is included in your model, right? So all the interactions we try to make a good case of that customer journey to be kind of holistic. Uh, there's some things that are notably impossible to measure, such as TV and radio. Uh, but saving that, when you are looking at just online, the idea is that your attribution is based on counterfactuals. So you basically try to score this person without, so you get the customer journey, journey and remove the particular interactions, that the particular touch points that were due to, say, online display, right? those ads that you see, and try to get what would be the baseline before that. And that lift, which does not account for a cross-channel interaction, but at least it gives you an idea of how much, how much of a lift you are getting just because of um, just because of the online display. Now, it's not causal, it's correlation, but still it lets you see what it is that you are doing. Is that, does that answer the question? Uh, we can talk after. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You just want to allocate budgets across these different channels and 
It, it, it's more on the optimization side, so I, I don't think you use hard numbers to allocate okay. value, uh, especially coming from a model. Uh, yeah. So when you mention including timing in your mo attribution model, what does that really mean? What does that mean? So basically, you can decide, I'm going to run, like, I'm going to train a model that just looks at the number of interactions you have. So you had three online display and to search. In that case, that model is blind to the fact that actually you searched three weeks ago and all the online display interaction like touch points happen in the same day. Uh, in the other model, you can you, you do your best to encode that those uh, temporal sequences in a way that you are going to have extra variables that will have different values for those two scenarios. Can you shed a, a little bit more light on how you encode the time? <laughs> yeah. So you so one easy way it's trying to get decayed versions of those interactions, right? So one variable is going to have, if you had three searches, that would be a stream. But then the next one would be the sum of each one of those searches decayed uh, by the amount of time until you actually made the visit. So in that case, for example, all searches would be very small. You, st you still will have the variable that has. Yeah. That's that. But the decay function is uh, arbitrarily chosen, or you oh, have you So what you do is you do a sweep on different decays and have basically let them all de like choose the one that considers more. Yeah. Is that the is there an artifact of the fact that you're converting your temporal data into non-temporal data? Meaning, if you had kept it in the temporal data sequence itself, and just say delay, buffer decision. Uh, well, but the, the problem is that at some point you have to encode your data set in a way that has each one of the observations has the same number yeah. of variables, right? Because that's that's how you build the, the DBM. So you have to fit that. You could just say, every second is a different variable, but then you will end up with a very, very wide data set, and DBMs don't do very well with extremely wide, extremely sparse So using hex data with your training process, how much code do you need to write? Oh, that's interesting. So it, it, it depends. So you still have to build your data set, right? Data set Put it somewhere. Uh, the actual model, so right now as it is, the actual model, I've been told that I can run uh, a grid search in DVM, which would probably save quite a bit of code. There's not that much code involved, to be, to be honest. If, they, if you choose the right R packages, pretty much everything is done for you. That's the truth. I do the parameter search with Carrot, I use other, I, I actually use the DBM packets to train, it's not that many lines. But what we really use is about speed. Uh, I mean, right now, we are we have like EC2 instances running R in parallel in, in, in the cloud. I don't think that's the most efficient way of using those EC2 instances, but we don't really have another <coughs> way of doing it. Yeah. So, do you have any heuristics to share as to what kind of temporal features have done best? I pretty much have said which features I use. <laughs> so I, I, I just I just use the decay then the rest right, right. Yeah. I understand, but, but you can look uh, at different ways, how do you decay? You can have you can I mean you can decay per day, you can decay per week, you can decay, you know, right. that much, this yeah. much, you can discard the data after mm -hmm. that days. I'm just curious if you have any more specific So so, so as long as you are not hitting the thousands of variables, I would say when you train your DVM, and then you look at the actual, like the relative influence of each one of those variables, that's already going to give you a very good hint as to what sticks and what doesn't. So usually you would make them compete, right? And let DVM choose the ones that right. And as a chooser, do you see any kind of consistent pattern across all the different models you look at? Or it just kind of all over the place based on whatever specific model configuration you're using? 
at, at that point, it really, it really becomes an art. I mean, there's no, no, because, because there's not, so in the particular case of marketing, if you look at the literature, they use, they use these uh, ad stock models that tend to do exponential decay. But the only reason they do exponential decay is because it's a decay, right? So, so there's no, there's no, there's nothing to hold on. Just a matter of trying. Different. So, so question on algorithm. So the gradient descent algorithm. This is gradient descent in a very loose kind of way. Right. <laughs> it's not. Uh, it's not like you've got a fixed set of parameters and you're doing gradient. You know, it's, it's inspired by gradient. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, part of the beauty is that it's not as good as I'm getting to the minimum. <laughs> no, that's exactly right. So, so it's uh, it's not clear that you actually want to get oh, exactly. Right, good point. Good point. Yeah. You could go to the minimum in one step. Right? Yeah. Exactly. So, I mean, you, you want to, I mean, in, in all machine learning, at, at the end of the game, you are trying to play is how can you describe your data in less parameters so that you actually hopefully are grabbing something that generalizes, right? So, in this case, we just want to just stay around there, but it's not about it. Oh, that's interesting. So GVM and the location are together, right? So you are using your GVM uh, with a logistic within a logistic regression framework. Yeah. yeah. So so at the end of the day, the outputs of your tree are going to be probabilities, right? Usually, often logistic regression is is confused with linear logistic regression. But here we modeling. The logistic transform of the probability by a fairly complex model. It's also logistic. Right. So in, the, in this case, if you, if you think about uh, what we are doing, you wouldn't want to do R to R classification, right? Because my classification is just whether you convert or not. And that's, in, in our case, I mean, you can have exactly the same um, journey and convert sometimes and not other times. And that's why you think about it. And Question about uh, I definitely understand the enthusiasm for scaling as big as possible on your data set, but mostly I notice that if you need that large data set, means your team will never generalize anyhow, so you are hopeless. So, yes. uh, how much does it actually matter rather than just going this net gigantically, just cut it down, sample properly, mm -hmm. and do a much smaller set, yeah. and you get yeah. the same result at the end? Yeah, and, uh, and, we do, and we do samples. So, for example, in this particular case, I could be much happier getting more trees than getting more rows. Yeah. I, I, I totally agree. And it's not clear to me that we have um, we have right now a problem that would benefit from billion of, billions of rows. That said, if you give me that billion of row classifier, we might not we might actually find a problem for it, right? So because part of like as I was saying, like feature engineering is kind of like a big part of what you are actually doing. But the reason you are doing that is because you can't fit bigger data sets of the ones, right? So it's, we get into that argument a lot of times. I'd say we'll fix it once we actually do those billion regressions. Uh, you don't have to the, the Google deep learning experiments on image classification, they just so you know, that they, because they can manage these massive data sets, right. they do it much better. Exactly. So if you get a good tool, but yeah, but, but there are also in Mongo's fact feature space, I mean. Well, that's it. So the bigger yeah. the feature space, and yeah. more data you need, generally. Yeah. Most, I would say, relatively small feature space, and therefore uh, more data does not really add very much beyond. Yeah, yeah, that, that is true. But see, like, part of the, part of the like, whole feature engineering thing yeah. is motivated by the fact that I actually have to go for a small feature space. from an application standpoint, how do you translate this model that you have into something that you give Google and say, hey, this is how I want you to target uh, you know, the, the, the users? So, for example, if you look at the effect 
of so one thing you can do once you have the GVM train is just look at the like the uh, marginal distribution, right? So I can actually look at what's the effect of you getting more and more, say, online display ads, right? And I get what I expect, which is that at some point there is saturation. Right now, nobody knows where that saturation is because you have to, you know, uh, compensate for every other thing that has happened to this particular user. Right? But now I can get there and I can start uh, putting frequency caps or absolute caps, for example, right? That's, so you, you can have like a kind of personalized cap for different people based on how many other things these guys have already done, right? That's, that's one simple example. Yeah. So um, you have the 28 days of historical data because right? mm -hmm. so guessing that the campaign Yeah. What are, they must have been that are more than 28 days. Mm, not necessarily, but like people visit, right? So I, I, I assume that 28 days is more than enough. I can't tell you if 14 days is more than enough because I've trained 28 days. It's not much more expensive for me to do it that way. Uh, because at the end, it's all about like building that data set within, you know, we use Hive to and big to collect this data, and that scales very well. Uh, so it might very well be the case that you can use for things. Um, okay. But there's some things that you do that have a longer memory. For example, visits or emails about rejoining because you might have to ask your significant other. I don't know. So do you take care of offline campaigns as well? Do we take offline yeah, campaigns? Right. So you, you can do that uh, either by following people or by using some kind of correlation, right? So at least I know where you are, I know where, what, you know, that. So, so it's, it's a tricky question. I'm, I think we can get some lift by incorporating that, but it's a huge task to build that data set and build it for it. I actually have a question for the hack uh, I'm curious how, I mean, this is very great piece of engineering. So when you access the cluster from the R console, the loads and packages, uh, can you summarize exactly what happened? So are we running, uh, are we exporting data frames? Are we running R packages <coughs> locally? What exactly gets exchanged between the R on the local node and the cluster? So the, the big data has to sit on the cluster. It's just not gonna fit on your R. Um, what's going back and forth is driving commands to say, you know, go, go load data over in the cluster, go do something there. You can pull back some fraction of the data, but if you say, give me all, and it's a billion, you're in trouble. But you can say, give me the first thousand, and you can start looking at the data in that way. Um, I think Angie has some other, we can push data over as well, but again, it's limited by the, the size of the arc and handle, right? Right, so you can upload data from your local machine onto the HTO cluster and do stuff on a cluster. But most of this, what's going on in R is simply you're sending like a REST API, you're posting something through our curl, mm -hmm. and then HTO does this thing, and then it returns the JSON, which you saw when we clicked that button, and then R kicks that in and then processes it and displays it nicely. So it's basically just a viewer. Like, I mean, are you feeding, like, are you using any modeling packages so far? Or is it all happening on the big data side? It, so you essentially just receive the summaries and the results of the it, It's data. all happening on the big data side. Right. It, it's the, the limits of, of what you can do here are say vector at a shot, go do something on the cluster, and then the, what you'd be essentially trying to do is have a modeling package in R that's saying, do these vector ops one at a time. Each vector is too big to hold in R, so they're not there. They're over there. And the latency is how fast they go back and forth vector by vector by vector op. So I, it's probably possible to do that, but I think you had efficiency problems for going back and forth that route. Can I, can I get, for instance, uh, sample of the matrix? Can I tell, let's say I want to feed the actual model in R, and I want to get you know a sample of this whole matrix, you know, matrix, and I want to get a thousand row, yeah. you know, so this, this like how how deep is this integration? I want to I want to get a piece of data. I want to do something wrong. Can I do that? So there's a, there's a question of where we are today and where the long-term vision is, right? So we are a startup less than a year and a half old and young or old, whichever you call it. But we've been blazing to getting the back-end works. Our core vision was to make the R users more productive, right? 
I myself was an R user waiting for two days for a GBM to finish, for a simulation to finish. So that's kind of how the core uh, evoke response as a startup came about was to make that life simpler, right? So then we started trying to make R itself faster, faster R, but then that doesn't actually give you the full experience of R and full experience of what is easily deployable. So what Cliff has put together is a very easy Java, which makes you run it anywhere in the cloud, on your desktop, on your laptop. You can model it locally and then take it to production. Right? So that's the high level. But the long term is ad hoc analytics. That's where really where the buck stops. And I think the, that uh, response is still waiting for us to invent and give you the full ply R carrot style experience. So you can then do a really good R, um, like go back and forth without even knowing that you're missing something. I think that's still, a, I would say, a year ahead of us, maybe six months. But Angie and Nidhi and other our team is slowly putting that together, and you have you get them as as we are building that. I hope that answered. We're definitely heading in that direction, where you can go pretty much anything you do locally, you can do remotely, and then we're going to paper over that difference uh, to the extent that it's possible, given the variances in size. Uh, are you looking into sort of being We definitely launch, uh, can be launched as a, a member of a Hadoop cluster, like we're a long running map job. Yeah. And we just hang around and consume those resources, but then we live as a cluster on our own. Are, are you doing like a vocal Wabbit style thing where you're just saying, you know, hey, thanks and giving heartbeats? Or, or is, it still, is it working within the like yard type? Like um, it, tool, it's, you know, we're using right? our own clustering technology, okay. uh, but we politely play with, in fact, Tom did all that work. Yeah, so we, we run as a long running mapper. So we're living inside of Hadoop under the Hadoop resource management and yeah, playing right. properly. And we can run with regular Hadoop or you know, with classic MapReduce or with Yarn, either way. Uh, it really doesn't make too much difference to us because once we sit on the resources, we use them the way that we, we want to. And, and we build our own cluster from multiple map jobs that communicate at the H2O and then can you sort of, so following on that, I mean, if you're going to do this like grid search or something, right? I mean, we have like multiple thousand node clusters, but if you need only 16 nodes, right, to build a model, you could distribute that grid search across the whole thing. The, the, we have a couple different grid searches. The current GBM one is launching the GBMs one at a time. They run uh, in parallel internally, um, but we're definitely going to be, and not too long in the future, launching them in parallel as well. Uh, we do have to do some resource management because a, a big enough GBM, a big enough data set, we will soak CPUs. Sure. And there's no point in launching anymore. Um, but for instance, like the GLM, which runs uh, tenfold cross-validation, uh, those all run parallel distributed around the cluster. And then if you run a GLM parameters grid search the same way, again, they're all running in parallel. And there's some resource management baked in there that we're moving into the GBM side too. And the installation <laughs> is actually very smooth. All three vendors support, I mean, with Cloudera very closely, we work with Hortonworks and MapR. We just, you do a Hadoop jar, pitch to a jar, it goes and installs itself. Give the number of nodes cited, the usual stuff. A non technical question, Antonio. So, could you comment something about the performance in terms of operationalizing the model with the business? So, you know, so there's a campaign that's going on for you, say, 27 days, roughly. So the, the campaigns will be coming. Well, it's just the 28 days. It's just like the look back okay. for each user. He might have been exposed to different campaigns at different times. So before H2O, what you know, what was the uh, you know what was the process? What was the performance compared to? Oh, there's uh, managers in each one of the marketing teams deciding what they like, <laughs> right? So this is this is the first like earnest attempt to like try to collect all that and score it in some uh, machine learning model. Um, there's no, I mean, we, we just use this for optimization. Again, marketing is still half science, half art. <laughs> he knows he's, he's from marketing. <laughs> Good. So I, I hope you like it. <laughs> OK, thank you so much for coming, everyone. <laughs> I want to give a round of applause to the speakers. Um, Trevor, thanks for coming.